Hello, everybody, and welcome to a brand new edition of Above and Beyond, Bridging the Gap to Accessibility and Inclusion. I'm your host, Anthony Frazina. Joining me today is a very special person. We have the Director of Special Projects and Innovation with the Ontario Disability Employment Network, Ingrid Musha. Ingrid, good morning. How are you? I'm fantastic, Anthony. How about yourself? I'm wonderful. Thank you so much for joining me today. This is a very special episode, and we're going to be talking about a lot of things happening within the community. I know this episode is going to be airing in May, but we have just undergone a really, really important uh, dynamic and change within our, our community, within Ontario. And we're going to get to that in, in just a second. But Ingrid, tell us about yourself. Tell us about your your involvement with disability in the community. Let me start by saying that uh, myself and the Ontario Disability Employment Network are uh, very happy and, and thankful for you providing us an opportunity to spread the message about employment opportunities, increasing employment opportunities for people who have a disability. Uh, as you mentioned, I am the Director of Special Projects and Innovation with Odin. And the, really, the, the way that I come to disability is because I have a family member who has a disability, a developmental disability. Um, I'm an engineer by trade, so when I was going through my career, I did not think that I would be involved in the disability community, but that just goes to show you that we can, um, that disability impacts more people than what we think. Uh, my son was born in 2010, and at that time, I did not know anyone who had a developmental disability. So I chose to leave my field to better understand how our family could support him and how we could be supported. And through that involvement in the Down syndrome community, I came across the Ontario Disability Employment Network, apply for a job, and they hire me. And, you know, that also speaks to um, the benefits of having diversity of thought and diversity of experiences for businesses because as an engineer um, you know i bring a different perspective to odin and they have been um they, that has benefited them right and so you and i are going to have this conversation about the benefits of hiring inclusively and with the intention of hiring people who have a disability i think uh, odin is a perfect example we have a very diverse uh, team of members who have different lived experience including disability and we are enriched by the diversity of thought within our uh, within our organization yeah and without disability diversity really doesn't exist and the prevalence of disability not only in hamilton in ontario and in canada that uh, dynamic and that demographic is only going to get bigger with our aging population, with disability being the only demographic with a fluctuation. And in saying that, meaning disability can happen to anyone at any time. So how do we react? How do we um, support that community reactive, proactively rather than reactively? And, and, you know, through employment, and let's get into the employment statistics, uh, Ingrid, if, if we can, uh, the employment rate with this for people with disabilities has gone up, but it also has a, an impact to ODSP as well. Can we speak on that a little bit? Yeah, I'll I'll touch on a couple of points points if I can, Anthony. The first one being, you know, the reality or the facts around disability. Um, the latest stats from Statistics Canada in December of 2023, uh, through their survey on disability, was that 27 percent of Canadians are experiencing disability. In Ontario, that's 28 percent. That's 4.3 million Ontarians who are comfortable enough disclosing that they experience a disability, that they live with a disability. That's a doesn't take into consideration people for whom stigma um, is preventing them from, you know, speaking and, and being their true self to what they're experiencing. That's that's one of the points that I want to touch on is that disability, people who are experiencing disability is not a small group. It's a, it's a, a, it's a large consumer base, if we can speak to that point. The other one is that when we think about people who are impacted by disability, people like myself, we're talking about 53% of the population. Again, a large number of people who are touched by disability. Employment rates currently are about, you know, compared to the um, employment rate for people who do not have a disability, which is typically around 80 to 85%, People who have a disability have an employment rate of about 60%. Now, that doesn't tell us uh, if 
that's full-time employment, uh, if it is precarious and, uh, employment, uh, if it is, uh, you know, temporary employment. So we know that, and we know that for people who experience certain types of disabilities, those rates are higher. For example, people with developmental disability, people who have autism, their unemployment rates are much, much higher. Um, meaning that, you know, they're not having the same access to employment. So coming back to the point that you just made, I ran ODSP. It has the, the uh, ODSP allowance, so the allowance for your uh, earnings has gone up. So there has been an attempt to ensure that people can access employment by preventing some of the barriers, which were the clawbacks when you work. There are benefits and there has been some uh, areas for still for improvement. So that's how I'm going to say that, that um, there has been an understanding that certain policy was creating barriers for people who wanted and were very willing to enter the workforce. That clawback has been changed from, I believe, used to be $250 to $1,000 now. Yeah. Uh, so people have more uh, more opportunities to access employment, but we know that there's room for improvement. The other point that I'm going to make is that there are still some myths out there in regards to what happens to your benefits, your health benefits, when you enter the workforce. Health benefits that you happen to have when you were um, receiving ODSP do not go away. So you can you can have a job. And if that um, employer is not providing you with benefits, you can still access those through ODSP. And if the employer does provide benefits and you happen to lose that job, is from what I understand, you can call your ODSP office and, and tell them that you no longer have benefits through your employment uh, or employer and that you want to go back into your ODSP benefits. And those should be reinstated without having to go through the same process as you did before to reapply. Yeah, and you talked about it, uh, Ingrid, and I'll just uh, touch on it again. With the employment rate for people with disabilities, and many people employed part-time don't necessarily have those benefits that come with full-time employment. Yeah. So there's that dynamic, and it's almost disincentivizing to speak, uh, to gain employment with the fact that there's also clawbacks as well. It's It's as if you're you're being money's being taken away from you uh, for actually, you know, making a contribution to community, um, you know, and it also lends itself to the question of, you know, when you when people with disabilities are employed and gainfully employed, you know, they become, you know, more economically um, viable to this community. You know, they become shoppers, and then the economic impact you know, accessibility within your storefronts, online accessibility. You you make that dynamic more accessible and more inclusive for that dynamic, you know, when given the opportunity to also be employed. W what do you think about that? Yeah, you know, going back to the concept of um, of ODSP and benefits, and, and I know that I just want to make sure that I note the fact that disability is complex. Disability impacts people very differently. So generalizations don't work. They don't work for humans, regardless of disability or whatever else that we're talking about. Um, but, you know, making the case for businesses to hire inclusively, when someone obtains full-time employment, that would always will be higher than the ODSP benefits. So it is in the best benefit of our communities that we built and that we support businesses to become disability inclusive so that they can hire full-time employees who happen to have a disability for those who can work uh, full-time and can access uh, you know, employment on a, on a full-time basis, because that will always be more than the ODSP benefit. Um, some employers will give you also uh, health benefits, which will also be a gain, right? When you look at the, the, the bigger scheme of being employed and, and being on ODSP. 
I'll just give you an example, right? Uh, in, in a community nearby uh, with a manufacturing facility, um, we had a case where we supported a business to hire from the deaf community. For that business, for those employees who gained that employment, who were in ODSP, who were accessing ODSP, their employment now is much higher. They're, they're making 50, you know, 50,000 a year. Mm -hmm. Definitely much higher than if they were on ODSP. Yeah, so, right. And so it's building the inclusivity within the business, building um, the capacity for the employment service provider that was supporting those job seekers, and then building and then understanding that we're also, uh, as a community, building those job seekers. Because, I, it, you know, I make the case none of us enter our jobs on, one, on day one knowing exactly what we we're supposed to do. We all build our capacity within our careers as we go through and experience what it is that we need to learn in on the job. It is the same for people who have a disability. We shouldn't be holding them to a different account. All of us start at zero when we get on day one and we build our capacity. Um, so, you know, it is a very complex conversation, ODSP employment, but I think if we continue with that concept that building communities where uh, job seekers are provided with the support that they need to access employment, when we build employment service providers that can support job seekers who have a disability to be successful in the workplace, and when we build businesses to understand what it takes to be disability inclusive, then we have a combination where people are supported properly to access employment. Let's talk about the dynamics of disclosure. For many people with an invisible disability, as it's not always present on the outside, you know, disclosure by way of prior to establishing an interview, after getting the job, what does disclosure look like to you? <laughs> Inter a great question. And a again, another interesting conversation. When we work with a business, we do do the work of helping them understand and bringing awareness of the fact that disclosure is can be very difficult, right? Uh, it, you are being put in a vulnerable position to discuss some things that may or may not be even relevant to the job that you're applying for. And so we help businesses understand that if you start with universal design, the, the principles for universal design within the processes that you have for attracting, hiring, and onboarding people. That need for disclosure, that formalized need for disclosure, it kind of takes back uh, a backseat. And I'll give you an example. When a business wants to be inclusive of the disability community, they should be intentional about it, and they should promote beyond just the line on their website that says that they're being inclusive of all people, right? That they're an equal employer, a, a equal opportunity employer. They should be noting that accommodations are available at any process or any step of the hiring process. Um, they should be asking when they're organizing an interview, what does the person need in order to be successful? We that's one of the sentences or that's one of the messages that we get businesses asking people what they need to succeed is better than asking what accommodations do you need, right? Go back to what are the essential functions of the job and what do people need in order to be successful? What do you need to fully participate in this meeting? You know, if you're setting up a, a, an interview and then providing information about you know, that accommodation, um, if we if we do it with enough time, we can provide the accommodation. So also be mindful of that. Uh, if you are hiring, take a look at your job postings. Are they disability inclusive? Do they call out people who have a disability intentionally? Are you saying in your postings that um, accommodations are, are, are available, that modifications can be provided, that you want people to succeed in the workplace? Like all, if you think from a universal design, then disclosing becomes a secondary thing because you're looking for what accommodation, for what are the things that people need in order to succeed in the workplace? Absolutely. Are you intentions-based or are you obligations-based? 
Ingrid, this has been great. We gotta take our first break. We'll be right back with more Above and Beyond. Walk past strangers' faces every day.